There may be those who wonder why the inspirational selection this morning consisted of an unfinished song by Brother Sam Cook. It was a song that he had begun writing and he was writing it for the Soul Stirrers as they were planning to release a new album. What we heard there was he was instructing them and explaining to them the Lord's Prayer. I think it's remarkable that he had to explain what thine meant in terms of thine glory. And you might have noticed he said, that means the glory is not ours, the glory belongs to God. It's also notable that it, it indicates very clearly that Brother Sam remained close to the Lord even before his untimely passing at the age of 33. But that there's something very powerful in what is unfinished because so often the world tends to think that something being done is the purpose of a thing. But when you understand how God moves, then you understand that God works in the unfinished. God has never done blessing. God has never done forgiving. God has never done walking with us. The world deals with things being over and finished, but to understand the gospel, you must understand that which is unending. That God is ushering into this age a world without end. And so that helps us understand then what happens <clears throat> in verse 8 of Mark's gospel in the 16th chapter as it is the first and original ending of the gospel. But the gospel of Mark has three different endings. Most modern Bibles indicate as much and even older translations of the King James make it clear that verses 9 through 20 are not found in the ancient authorities. And so with that we journey and we look at this last verse of the first gospel ever written. Um, the, the beauty of YouTube is that you can now go back and look at the previous two sermons to understand why, gospel, why the gospel of Mark is, in fact, the first gospel written. Matthew was written 15 years later, and it was placed in front of Mark's gospel for a number of reasons. But verse 8 here is the very last verse of the first gospel. And it reads, so, we, so they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The title of this message is simply taken from the first word of this verse, the word so. And in this world, as we look at this particular verse, and we, we must marvel at the fact that afraid is the very last word. And in the Greek, it's phobos, phobia, where we get fear. Fear is the very last word in the very first gospel. The gospel ends with the word fear, which is not the way that the world would want us to, to think of fear, because what the gospel is actually telling us is that fear is a good thing. You see, in the world, negativity sells. And so the world would prefer that fear be viewed negatively. In the world, negativity makes money. Negativity gets views. Negativity gets clicks. Negativity gets attention. Positivity does not sell. And yet this text reveals that the most positive thing that ever happened in all of history ended with the word fear. This empty tomb, this is the single most important thing that will ever happen in all of existence. And this first ending, this original ending of Mark's gospel, it is found in the oldest manuscripts. We do not have the original copy of the gospel of Mark. We only have the oldest copies of the manuscript. And all of them end with the word phobos. They fled for they were afraid. If you recall the last time we met during third Sunday, we dealt with the intermediate ending, the, the numberless verse that is found after verse 8, that began with the word and. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter, and afterward Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. 
And that led to the final ending in verse 9. Now, after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. These three successive verses are three different endings that are written over 400 years apart. Yet if we reverse engineer, starting from verse 9 and work backwards to this original ending, it begins to make more chronological sense. Now after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. And all that had been commanded them, they briefly told those around Peter. And afterwards, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them and said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The endings actually make more sense chronologically when read backwards. Yet, it is not the chronology that the gospel writers are concerned with. It's not time, it's the theology. The theology of these three endings indicate to us what we're supposed to understand about this empty tomb. What we're supposed to understand about this great Easter celebration. When we understand this theologically, we must understand what Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome saw. They were expecting to find a corpse. They were expecting to find Jesus dead. That's why they brought anointing spices and oil and linen. They had actually believed that Jesus, in fact, would be in his tomb. And so Mark tells us that they found a young man dressed in white and said, Do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go and tell the disciples and Peter, he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. Before he died, he told them to meet him in Galilee. Jesus is in Galilee waiting for them to show up because they're all late because they were doing what was expected of them in the world, which is death means death. And they failed to understand death means life when you're in God. Death is simply the pathway through which you live forever. And they did not understand that. How sad to think about that very, there may be many people, a great number of people, very, a, a very great number of people in the world today who miss their blessing because they are not where they're supposed to be, where Jesus is waiting on them. Instead, they're doing what the world expects them to do. Here they are at the tomb looking for a body whenever they were told the body would not be there. And Jesus is in Galilee waiting for Peter, waiting for James, waiting for John, waiting for Mary of Magdalene, where, where, waiting for Mary, the mother of James, waiting for Salome, waiting for Thaddeus, waiting for Philip, waiting for Matthew, waiting for James, the son of Alphaeus, waiting for all of them. And there they are, hiding and afraid. They are afraid because they do not understand the good news. The good news means the things that should make you afraid ought to give you comfort. Fear keeps us alive. If some people were more afraid, they'd still be alive. If some people were more afraid, if they were afraid of disappointing their family, if they were afraid of letting people down, if they were afraid of disappointing God, if they were afraid of going to hell, if they were afraid of living hell on earth, because you don't have to die to go to hell. If you live the wrong way, you can experience hell right here. If more people were afraid, then they would find God because then they would go where they're supposed to be. So they went out and they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And yet here, this is also the sign of their disobedience. Jesus told them not to tell anyone about the miracles he was performing until he had been raised from the dead. And once he has been raised, they do the opposite. They go home and they say nothing. And yet interestingly enough, the word so is not even found in the Greek here. This verse in the Greek begins with the Greek word chi, meaning and or also which instead gets moved to the intermediate ending, meaning the English translators are doing something intentional with the beginning word of each ending, so and now. The first word of each ending, so and now. The way we use the word so in English is we put it in the middle of a sentence to connect two things together so we won't have a run on. But we don't begin a sentence with so, but the translators are starting the verse with so in order to make a theological point about what the empty tomb means. Verse 8 begins with a word that should be in the middle of a sentence. 
We do not begin sentences with so, and yet the very last verse of the first gospel says, so they went out. But could it be that what the gospel writers are making very clear, could it be that what they're explaining is that the reason fear should be the source of our happiness is that the type of fear they're talking about is not this type of cheap, worldly fear, not this type of jump scare fear, but instead, if we look at the word terror and amazement, it speaks of a type of awe. That there should be a sense of amazement that something has happened that has changed all of history. And therefore, with so being at the beginning of the sentence, it's not that so is in the middle of a sentence separating two things, it's that so is placed here in this very last verse to separate all of time and eternity, to separate all of existence, to explain that things were one way before he went to the cross, but after he dies and he's raised, so things will be another way. In other words, everything after so causes us to re-examine our lives, to re-examine history, to re-examine the present and the future. Before this so right here, if somebody was a sinner, they would live a sinner, die a sinner, spend all of eternity dealing with the penalty of that sin. Yet there's a so that's placed right here. There's something in the middle that says regardless of what came before, now something has been placed here that changes everything. That once upon a time sickness was the end. Once upon a time sin was the end. Once upon a time death was the end. And yet this empty tomb indicates that so separates everything that came before saying that sickness will no longer be the end because there will be healing. Sin will no longer be the end because there will be forgiveness and confession. That death will no longer be the end because there will be eternal life. In other words, you can say to yourself, this soul, this empty tomb, this coordinating conjunction that went out to Calvary and died and got up on the third day, this coordinating conjunction of infinity and eternity is the reason that no matter how afraid I might feel, no matter how worried I might become, no matter how daunting the situation is, there's something in the middle of my circumstance that says no matter what happened before, so I can go on and do something else. I might be going through hell on earth, so my God is real, which means I can have victory in the end and I still have heaven waiting for me. The Lord is testing my faith. The devil might be testing my nerves, so my testimony will be that much stronger on the other side of my affliction. The agony is great so the aggrandizement can be greater. The pain is great so the promise can be greater. It rains so we can have flowers that bloom. We mourn so we can dance. We struggle so we can strut. We go through mess so we can be amazed. So we must go out and tell the world that we know somebody who is a way maker. We know somebody who is a healer. We know somebody who's a sustainer. We know somebody who's a caretaker. That when we lose the will to go on, that we know a will in the middle of a will. And I'm going to tell you like my five-year-old said, when I was explaining to her, the only thing you have to know, if you never learn all of A through Z, if you never learn the E equals MC squared, if you never learn all of the words in the dictionary, if you know what happened on the third day, the that's all you need to get you to life. So I was asking her last night, I said, Jesus died on Friday, but what happened on Sunday? And just as Psalm 82 says, from the mouths of babes comes perfect praise, which can be a bulwark against your foes. My little beautiful five-year-old put it in a way that I can't put it with all my degrees. She said, on the third day, he came alive again. And I want you to know, no matter what you're going through, he came alive again. He will bring your situation alive again. He'll bring your circumstance alive again. He will bring you up off of your sick bed. He'll bring you out of your circumstance. He'll bring you through your difficulties. He'll give you the power to overcome demons. He'll give you a testimony that is unmatched. He'll give you a new walk, a new smile, a new reason to give him all the glory and all the praise. May all of God's people say amen.